पंकजम कलिमल प्रद्धम सिन श्रेय से मुखम करो दिवाजाल पंगुम लिंखय दे गिरी युत्कृपादम वंदे परमानंद माधव यम ब्रह्मा वरुणेन्द्र रुद्र मरुद तुन्विव्य तव वेद स्वांग पद क्रमोपनिषद ध्यानावस्थितत्कृतेन मनसा पश्य योगिनो यौन विदु सुरासुरगण देवाय तस्म नम ओ शांति 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 This is uh, an audiovisual serialization of um, lessons from the Gita, Sri Mad Bhagavat Gita, a work of Veda Vyasa, who is also known as Krishna Dayapayana Vyasa. The name of the book is Sri Mad Bhagavat Gita. So here we have a picture that shows a flowering tree, a tree which has a, an upright trunk, which has branches on all sides, and it's in full bloom. This symbolizes one of the central teachings of the Gita. Three principles are involved in it. One called Sri Mat. Sri Mat is a state of great abundance, grace, and beauty. Urjida, that means uprightness, steadfastness, and uprightness with great energy. Vipudi Mat, that means. having a capacity to unfold and produce all values which are lying dormant when you can present when you can bring them forth that is called vipudimatha so these are the three principles which the gita want to teach we should be able to function in such a way that there is so much of shri abundance grace in our life and we should be able to station ourselves to perform whatever is our real duty we should be able to bring forth all the potentials in us to actualization and when we fail in any of these three aspects we have a problem and that you know the central figure of this book was confronted with such a problem and the solution of the problem came from the lord himself the lord who is presented in the present book both as the lord and the teacher or jagat guru the name shrimad bhagavat gita shrimad is 
represented by this picture, as I told you. That is where there is the presence of the Supreme Goddess, Lakshmi, the Goddess of Christ. Then you can make sure that nothing is lacking. And Bhagavad Gita is such a benign, gracious teaching and therefore um, its title begins with the word Srimad. Then Bhagavad Gita. The word Bhagavad Gita can be interpreted as the song of the Lord, the song by the Lord and the song for the Lord. The Lord here means the absolute truth and this is a song which glorifies the absolute truth and it is sung for the purpose of the absolute truth. And even the one who is listening to it is only a manifestation of the absolute. So we can say it is a song about the absolute, sung by the absolute, and for the absolute. In that sense it is Bhagavad Gita. The word Gita, although it means song, it is not to be taken in the sense of a song like an ordinary a melody. When Dante calls his book Divine Comedy, it's not a comedy like Merchant of Venice or Midsummer Night Dream, but when you go through it, you can see from darkness it slowly rises to a great light and we finally come to a state of great joy. Similarly, when you approach the Gita, you may be in a state of depression, but as you go through it, your mind brightens up as if you are listening to the divine music. So in that sense, the Gita is a song. Also in Plato's Republic, we come across the term, the hymn of dialectics. There is no hymn there. But the meaning of the hymn of dialectics is that it transports your mind to a higher state as if you are listening to a hymn. So it is called the hymn of dialectics. It's again in that sense we should understand the Gita to be a song. Srimad Bhagavad Gita. That's the name of the book. And this book is presented in one of the chapters of the Mahabharata. Mahabharata is the greatest, the biggest epic ever written with 100,000 verses. In that there is a chapter called Bhishma Parva. And in the Bhishma Parva, the Gita occurs with 700 verses. But those 700 verses, if they are taken separately, then also it can stand by itself. In the Mahabharata, war is like a canvas on which the Gita philosophy is painted. Of course, understanding the Mahabharata enables us to know Gita better. But even if you do not know Mahabharata still, this will make sense to you. The teaching of the Gita is a perennial teaching and it is for all time, for all people, anywhere in the world. Nowhere in the Gita there is a reference to India. Nowhere in the Gita there is any reference to any particular religion. It studies of man his consciousness, his behavioral pattern. So it gives a behavioral science 
values and the problems with which mankind is confronted everywhere. So it is a philosophy for all mankind, not parochial and um, the person who wrote this was a genius, a mastermind. In the Mahabharata, we see stories, one story leading to another story. It's like um, so many novels put together. In the presentation, we again and again come to poetic themes. So you can read a real poetry in it. There's lyric in it. It is dramatically conceived with a real dramatic setup. And no book on earth has gone so deep and so wide in human in the study of human psychology as in the Mahabharata. So this mastermind called Vyasa, he sculpted this book with the mind of a great architect. And how it is elaborated? There is no single detail left without full consideration. So when we study Gita, Again and again we will come to know what a great mind was Vyasa's and how he conceived the whole thing as a work of art as well as a great philosophy. And now in this book there is a structure. The first thing I want to tell you is about the structure and Andy will be able to draw that. It's uh, like an archway. Suppose you build an arch with bricks. This has 18 bricks laid. Um, the first chapter is like a horizontally placed brick. 18th chapter is also a horizontally placed brick. And as you go from the first brick to the ninth brick, the slanting position of the bricks changes in such a way that the ninth brick becomes absolutely vertical. The tenth is also vertical. Thus the actual middle of the book comes between the ninth and the tenth chapter. When we go from the tenth chapter towards the eighteenth chapter, we see that uh, it became again horizontalized. The 18th chapter is fully horizontalized. So the first chapter is on par with the 18th chapter. The problem with which we begin the first chapter uh, is fully resolved as we come to the 18th chapter. In the middle of it, that is, the very end of the ninth chapter, there is a secret. It's like a golden leaf which marks the entire middle of this great work. And there is one verse, that is the very last verse of the ninth chapter. This is the only verse that is repeated twice in the whole of the Gita. And that comes again in the eighteenth chapter. And that gives us a secret of the entire work. So how he conceived these two these chapters. When we go from the first chapter to the ninth chapter, there is a systematic way of leading us higher and higher and higher and higher till you come to a great height. And when we are led down from 10th chapter to the 18th chapter. 
there is a stress on experiencing what you have learned up to the ninth chapter. Say in our physics class, when you go to a school, you have the theoretical aspect, then the applied aspect. Similarly, there is theoretical philosophy up to the ninth chapter, and there is applied philosophy from the tenth chapter to the eighteenth chapter. We hear of psychoanalysis, when a person has some mental problem, and if he goes to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist analyzes uh, so that the person may understand the problem which was lying hidden in him. And when once it is brought to the surface and made known to the patient that itself cures the patient. But in the Bhagavad Gita, the analysis that is given is not one single analysis. We have a fourfold analysis given. And each of us can apply this analysis in our own life and discover for ourselves what is hidden in us and we can discover a true identity and though that discovery through the fourfold analysis these are some of the secrets we want to um, bring to light during these classes and thus the structure which is shown here is very important. And in that structure, from the first chapter to the 18th chapter, we see that there is a gradual rising and a falling. We call it a dialectical ascent and a dialectical descent. The word dialectical is to be understood as yoga and mimamsa. When two counterparts are brought together, yoked together, united, it's called yoga. Mimamsa is a critical way of thinking. In yoga mimamsa, you are using unity of understanding with a critical acumen. And in that, uh, he has shown a vertical line as well as a horizontal, uh, a horizontal line and a vertical line cutting it. And the, so there is on the plus side of it, you can place this world, you call it Jagat, am I right? Jagat. Jagat means the world. Anything which is of a nature of moving or changing, that is Jagat. In this world of ours, from the simplest atoms, and even within the atom, there is a world of change. All the particles are all the time moving, and our own Earth is moving, the solar system is moving, all the galactical systems are moving, the entire universe is moving and therefore Jagat means this vast world of becoming that we place on the plus side of that horizontal line there. And the other side of it, that is on the minus side of it, we put Jivan, Jivan, the individuated life in us. So the individuated life, the single individual, he is facing this grand world of complexity. He himself is complex, but he is an individual. He is one, and there are the many. And he has to relate himself to that. So from the minus side, he brings himself to a neutral zero. From there, he is facing the plus side of the world. This is called the world of transaction. And it is in that transactional world we have 
the thousand and one problems. The child with whom we relate could be a problem. Husband can be a problem. Wife can be a problem. Home can be a problem. Marketplace can be a problem. The government can be a problem. That's everywhere. That's why Rousseau said, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. And it's the relationship between the jiva and the jagat. But there is one more principle. That is a vertical principle. That is called Ishara. The innate principle of control and government. The jagat and the individual are both controlled and governed by a single principle. It's called Ishra. In the Atma Padesha Shadaka of Narayana Guru, she says, the world within and the world outside, it is one and the same karyo or functional reality that is operating. The world outside is also the same reality. The world within is also the same reality. So we have a cosmological world and we have a psychological world. The cosmos and the psyche are, if you bracket it, then both are ruled by the same principle. We call it Ishvara. Ishvara, in the purest sense of that term, the word Ishvara came from the root it, which means to govern, to control from within. It's not an outside entity, it's an entity from within. If you take an atom, say, uh, there is the nucleus and there is the electron which is going around it and it is a principle from within which is deciding how exactly the electron should move in its orbit it does not go beyond that and in the same way when your heart is circulating the blood it is a principle from within which is circulating it in the solar system all the planets are going in their orbits because of the same innate principle. And this is what we call, in general, Ishvara. So that is the third principle which we have given here with a vertical line. And, and now these two have to, are balanced between on either side of God or either side of Ishvara. The word God which you see in theistic religions, that is um, much of a personalized view, but here now we are using it in a more philosophical sense. And one can have a very personalized view also. Um, we will come to all those afterwards. Anyway, this is the scheme before us. And this Ishara and this Jiva and the Jagat, how are they defined? Ishura is defined as Sat, Chit, and Ananda. So this is a book. It exists. When I raise it, I can feel the weight of weight. I cannot say there is a book where it is not. And you will not deny if I say here is a book. So this is called Satyam. Satyam means one which has satness, which has little beingness. And I know that this is a book and that is a glass. That means my act. I have knowledge about its being, which is different from my knowledge of the beingness of the glass. So a thing exists along with the knowledge of that existence. <coughs> That knowledge is called chit. And there is a value implied in it. Ananda. The, 
the book has a value, the glass has another value. So that's called Ananda. So whatever you experience here, it all should be supported by one pure existence. It should all belong to one common knowledge. And it all belongs to the a range of values, one and the same value to which all values belong, and that is called the Ishwara. And when you take the Jiva, Jiva is Chit Jada. It is Chit, that is consciousness, and Jada, something inertial. So there is an inertial aspect in us, and there is an animated aspect in us, a pure conscious aspect in us. And between this inertial aspect and the consciousness, there are many, many gradations possible. So an individual, sometimes he can have such kind of an alertness, a wakefulness of consciousness that he forgets about his inertial aspect at all. And sometimes he is so much bogged down by his inertia that he does not even know that he exists. For instance, when a person in his deep sleep does not know that he exists and the world exists, it is a state of inertia which is covering up everything. So these two aspects, between the, these two aspects of inertia and light, the individual lives. And when you take, to the, take the word, it's called Prakriti, Prakriti is again defined as Prakashena Karodi di Prakriti. That means there is operations going on there, continuous function going on there, and that function is controlled by three principles, three modalities. The modality of um, um, gain, say, losing oneself from all shackles and all bondages. And the other is freezing everything and holding it in a stable state. Holding one in a stable state is called stiti. And becoming pure, becoming pure consciousness that is called prakya. And in between there are many functions. It is called pravarti or function. So there are these tri triple aspects. And this world is belonging to that. And the world is functioning like that. So we have here the Ishwara, the Jiva and the Jagat. Ishwara is defined as Satchidananda and the Jiva as Chijjada and the Jagat as the Jada Prakriti. And now people, um, they can be variant because of their adherence to these principles. When a person is too much on the inertial side, he becomes blinded. When a person is on the light side or the bright side, he becomes very knowledgeable. We have taken here two representative characters. From the very beginning of the book to the very end of the book, these two persons are there. Um, the first chapter begins by saying, Dhritarashtra Vacha. Okay, Imetro. Now pray I. <coughs> so we, we see three eyes in this book. One is the blind eye of Dhritarashtra. He has eyes but he cannot see. The other is the eye of Arjuna which is wide open. The very word Arjuna means a person with arjava, a person with such steady gaze, wakefulness, alertness. 
So one person doesn't see and the other person sees. One person does not want to see, the other person wants to see. Actually Krishna was willing to explain everything to Dhritarashtra but he was not in a mood to listen. And Krishna wanted to teach Arjuna and Arjuna was willing to listen. And in us also there is a Dhritarashtra. Also there is an Arjuna in us. Sometimes we are like Dhritarashtra. We refuse to see. We refuse to look. We refuse to understand. We become blindfolded. And sometimes like Arjuna, we seek, we look, we want to see. So there is an an alternation between these two aspects in us. Even in very good people who want to have full knowledge, who want to be realized, who want to be dedicated, they find for some reason a cloud is coming over them and then they feel as if they are possessed and they are taken away from the path. And after some time it is as if the possession was gone and then they are freed, they are released and then they come back. So we alternate between Arjuna and Dhritarashtra. And what is the third eye? So here, Dhritarashtra's eye, we should keep towards the jagat. And Arjuna's eye is of the jiva. Then there is a third eye. It is a light. A light which has within it an eye. The Lord is like a light which is illuminating our path, illuminating our mind, illuminating our intellect. And it is not only really illuminating, that I is intently looking, watching, seeing all that is happening. It is the Sarva Sakshi, the greatest witness in us, the witness that knows everything, that sees everything. And it's not just an eye, it's an eye with a light and therefore it can illuminate also. So that is the difference between the eye of the Lord and our eye. We only see. The Lord shows and enables us to see. There is a combination of, say, light, the eye to work. There has to be the capacity to see and also there should be a light falling on the object. And it is in the Lord we see a combination of them both. So this um, dark eye that also represents what we may call bondage, bentha. Suppose there is absolute darkness and you do not see the path, then you remain stationary, you cannot walk, you cannot run, you cannot go anywhere. You say, I cannot see. It is as if you are bound. You are not bound, but you feel bound because of darkness because of ignorance. And when there is light, it's as if freedom has come. You are already liberated because of the light. Now you can move you, and, and you are emancipated. So Arjuna represents emancipation or the search for emancipation and Tridrashtra bondage. And when you are finally released, you become like the Lord. You are not you are never bound and there is no need for freedom also because you, you are never bound. And these are the three principles which we see here. <coughs> this book is presented in the form of a dialogue a dialogue between um, a person who was very active and then he came to the battlefield and something happened to him. Could you show the picture of the Vishada? <coughs> He 
here is a picture of a person who is in a state of frustration, conflict. She feels very depressed. And that picture is very symbolic. If you look at it, you can see that he is shutting himself from the rest of the world. She is holding himself. You can always watch. When you go to a strange place, if people do not know who is sitting next to him or standing before him, they always put their hand across as if they want a protection. And they want some sort of a fortress behind which they want to protect themselves. So when you are not sure of the world, you want to flee. This kind of a state in Sanskrit is called Vishada. The word Vishada is very significant. Visha in Sanskrit means poison. Ad means to eat. It is as if you have taken poison. Conflict is taking poison. Something has poisoned your mind. Something has poisoned your interest. Something has poisoned your vision. And even physically, something very toxic is happening within you. And your system is poisoned. And when once your system is poisoned, and when you are in a state of anger, when you are in a state of sadness, grief, if somebody says a joke, you cannot smile. Your, your sympathetic system is inhibited now. Until that poison is all washed away. And hence the Indian medical system, it begins by saying, Raga di Roga. Raga, coloration. So your mind is colored with a sense of attachment, with sense of anger. There are a number of things with which mind, the psyche can be colored. So that color, such colorations are called the rogas, diseases. Disease. You have no. You are not at ease because of this visha, the poison that has gone into it. And the answer to this, today I received a very beautiful paper from one of my old colleagues, a professor who was of Benares Hindu University. He says how knowledge can be used as a medicine for therapeutic purposes. Jnana is a huge people sometimes use Hatha Yoga for therapeutic purposes and he is speaking of Jnana Yoga. It's very true. How knowledge can be a corrective. And to a person like this, which you see in this picture, um, he wants a release from that. And that the release comes by administering knowledge. Bhagavad Gita is like a psychotherapy because it's all Krishna is talking Arjuna out of his blues. But just not ordinary talk. This is where wisdom is administered as a medicine. So we all need that. So every now and then we also go into such states. And there we need the wisdom of a teacher, a wise person, the light of God to bring us out of it. And that wisdom needs you to relate to it. And such kind of a relationship is called parasperia. For parasperia, it's a kind of a, an equation. You see, on one side is a disciple, the other side is the, t the guru, or one side is the devotee, and the other side is God. 
and between them is this bipolarity. And from the teach, from the student, there comes devotion, bhakti, and bhakti is expressed through shraddha. Shraddha means one-pointed attention. If a student is devoted to his teacher, she would in allow even one word to escape the lips of his teacher. So you want to listen to it, ponder over it. So first thing is listen, shravana. Then manana, pondering over it. Then living it, vidityasa. And then you can say, he is relating. This is how a student relates, a disciple relates, a devotee relates through bhakti, through shraddha. Only through shraddha, only through such one-pointed attention, one gets knowledge, jnana. That is also said in the Bhagavad Gita. From the other side, from the teacher's side or from God's side, there are also two things. One is Krupa, the other is Karunya. So there is Krupa and Karunya. Um, Krupa is the grace that comes from the teacher or from God. And there is a personal interest in the welfare of the, t the student or the devotee. Thus, Shraddha is met with grace. And uh, Bhakti is met with compassion. And that binds them into one, that unites the teacher and the taught. And such a state is called Upanishad. Upanishad, I can take another picture. And you can draw a disciple at the feet of a guru. <coughs> so when you go to your guru, the, the guru is placed above and the disciple prefers to sit down. There's great meaning in it. What is immediately known is the wisdom of the teacher. So he is placed high. And you place yourself down. But there is no sense of inferiority there. You are still seeking. You are at an alpha level. The guru is at an omega level. From the Alpha, you are also rising to the Omega. And so you sit, you prefer to sit down. And then you relate by listening. And it is called Upa Nishat. Upa means to be near. Ni means down. Shat means to sit. It has also another meaning. That means that which destroys ignorance or darkness is also called Upanishad. The Guru is a, is a light and you are bringing your darkness to him and the Guru destroys the darkness. So that is also called Upanishad. Upanishad also means a secret teaching. It is secret not in the sense of somebody is talking in the ear, but it has a depth of meaning. Only by preparing yourself, you get the secret of it. And thus, relating oneself to God or to Guru is an Upanishadic context. It says Upanishadic situation. The Bhagavad Gita is an Upanishad. It's called Upanishad, so that means 
That's a plural use, which means a 18 chapters are to be treated as 18 open natures or 18 aspects of the open natures. In each one there is a teaching. So this is an open natures. What is it? What is happening there? What is this wisdom we speak of? The wisdom that is spoken of here is called Brahma Vidya. And that Brahma Vidya is symbolized by one single um, formula called Om. So Om is a symbol. In that there are three sounds and followed by silence. A, U, M. Okay. Now we have to try new. You can also show. Say a. Uh, a fully opened mouth. To say ah, you have to open your mouth fully. Similarly, when your mind is fully opened, you are in the transactional world, of gross matter, various objects, and there is a subject-object duality. Let me put there, transactional. So that's a transactional world represented by the first aspect of Om. When you want to say Om, you say Ah, Om. So the, to begin with, you are in the transactional world. And then you go to the next, draw a half cross mouth now. Half closed mouth is also like a half closed mind. You are closing one half out. That is the transactional world. You are all within yourself in a subjective world of dreams. And then finally you have your fully closed mouth, which means mm. So there is no subject and there is no object. So this Fully opened mouth, you may call the wakeful. Half closed, you may call the dream. And the fully closed one, you may call deep sleep. Jagrat, Sopna, and Sushupti. And apart from these three, there is one aspect, pure silence. That is not wakeful, that is not dream. That is not deep sleep. What is it? You cannot name it. You call it the fourth. Turiya. Turiya means the fourth. And these four aspects are represented by Om. Therefore, Om has become a true symbol of Brahman, the Absolute. If there is any science, any knowledge, which is worth the name, it is Brahma Vidya. Why? Because that is the only science which includes in its purview, in its scope, everything of the transactional, everything of the dream, everything of the deep and conscious, and everything of the transcendental. Think of any experience other than this four, you cannot think of. Anything we experience should either be belonging to your wakeful world or to your subjective or dream world or to a deep unconscious world or a transcendental world. So, in one circle you can include all this. And that which encompasses everything is called Brahman. Brahad means big 
big enough to include everything. And therefore, the science, the absolute, is called Brahma Vidya. Bhagavad Gita claims to be a science of the absolute. Because it deals with all these four aspects of the Om, or all these four aspects of the absolute. And in that, we see a very special kind of game going on. We have previously shown a horizontal line with a plus side and a minus side. On the plus side we put the Jagat or the cosmologic world and on the minus side we put the psyche, the individual consciousness or the world within us and the world outside us. And for us to know anything, we say if I recognize here is a glass of water, my eyes look at it. So I get a perception which is supported by my previous knowledge of a glass. And I have in my mind a mental image of the glass which is supported by the concept of glass. Thus from the deep level of my unconscious there comes the same conceptual revival which is affecting both the perceptual side and the mental side. The mental image and the object are both made to be recognized by the revival of the recall of a concept and it is coming from the deep unconscious where it was remaining um, silent and then once I know it, I bring it to the meaning of it, the meaning of it is experiencing it, enjoying it, or suffering it. And thus, from the transactional world, it becomes my affectivity. From my mental world, it becomes my affectivity. Thus, it makes a circle on either side, and then it goes up to an omega. And thus, from the alpha to the omega, there is always a continuous flow of mental energy and consciousness and when it comes to the Omega you have come to the close of a one gestalt or one uh, meaningful experience and then you go to the next or it can be connected with the next one this, this is a process which is always continuing and in the middle of it if you put a circle the eye consciousness you are experiencing there and from that eye, on the plus side, you say, I do. And on the minus side, you say, I will. And at the bottom level, from where the alpha comes, you say, I am. And the top, you say, I enjoy. So there is a kartrutva there, a matter of doing. There is an icha. So there is a karma shakti and an icha shakti. There is a jnana shakti. Jnana shakti means the power of knowing. And then there is the foga, the enjoyment of it. But if you can bring them all to the center of you, you become a fully centralized person, then you are a yogi. So instead of the dissipation of this energy, of a dormant desire coming up and it is rotating about the transactional and the virtual and then dissipating you bring it centralized then it is called yoga and in this book which is a Brahma Vidya it also is a yoga chastra it disciplines you it teaches you how all your energies can be conserved and you can be a fully centralized person. The entire world could be outside and it could be inside. And you can see the outside world with your inside world and you remain at 
absolutely serene, silent, unaffected, and that you are participating fully. There is no functional, there is no dysfunction or any malfunction, but even when functioning it is as if there is nothing to function. And that is called the Yoga Shastra. So these are the things we should know about the Bhagavad Gita, that it is a sampada, a dialogue between a disciple and a guru. It is the relating of an individual both with the world and God. And it is a science of the absolute. It is also a discipline by which you become fully centralized and you become established within yourself. And with these preliminaries, now let us enter into the book called the Gita, the first chapter. Vishada Yoga, I already said that here is a person who is in a state of sorrow, but what is represented here on the board is only Vishada and not Vishada Yoga. Now what is the difference between Vishada and Vishada Yoga? Yoga is described as by Patanjali as uh, Chittavrti Nirodha, the modulation of the mind when it is fully um, stopped, then you say yoga. But in a state like this, where a person is very much disturbed, when his whole system is poisoned, how can you call it a yoga? But still we call this yoga. Why? If you take the life of people like Sri Rama, when the great Rishi Vishwamitra came to take Rama away, Rama was in a despondent state. He was sad. He was in a state of Vishada. And then after that he overcame by learning wisdom from Vasishta. So the Yoga Vasishta Ramayana is a book which shows the Vishada of Rama. Lord Buddha, he was in a state of Vishada during the six years of his penance when he could not find the truth and afterwards he became uh, a great yogi. Jesus Christ, before he received the grace, for forty days he was in torments. He was fasting and he was tested by the devil. He had Vishada and afterwards he had yoga. So anyone who became a real yogi had first passed through an experience of Vishada. Arjuna undergoes Vishada. And in the Gita, we are given two cases. Duryodhana's Vishada contrasted with Arjuna's Vishada. Duryodhana has simple Vishada like this. And Arjuna had Vishada Yoga. And this is how we should see when we are depressed, when we suffer, are we in a state of Vishada or are we in a state of Vishada Yoga? And if our pain, our sorrow, our grief is leading us later to yoga, then fine. And if it is leading us to greater pain, greater misery, then we are lost. I think um, uh, we'll stop it here with these preliminaries. I did not want to enter into the book today, so we will begin from tomorrow. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamada Chede Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vishishyade Om Shandhi 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 Shandhi